Am I on? I am on. Excuse me. Test. Testing one, two. Good evening and welcome to uh, the 2022 Lewis Lecture Series. Uh, we have had a wonderful worship this morning with Reverend Olu Brown. We've been looking forward to this for uh, at least two years. We started this uh, long before uh, COVID ever came and we had to do uh, pivot twice to get where we are today. We were asked, uh, I was asked a couple of times this morning, uh, who is John P. Lewis? John P. Lewis was a long time member of Central. His family uh, continues their membership with First. Uh, <coughs> Joe has not been well and is not able to, his, his widow uh, was not able to attend, uh, but her son Alan and his wife Nancy are with us this evening. <laughs> John was a, a faithful member and a longtime pharmacist in Rogers, and Sandy reminded me this morning, she was on staff when John was still uh, in business. And whenever anybody came to the door needing help with prescriptions, John was always the go-to for the pastor. John never turned anybody away. When he passed away, the family decided that they wanted to establish a foundation to continue a lecture series. So the foundation has uh, uh, money that uh, accrues. Some goes back into the foundation. Some goes to pay to cover for the, the uh, speaker series. So that, in a nutshell, is John P. Lewis, and we thank you. The, uh, Nancy was at handing out cards. Uh, if you did not get a card, uh, these are for to write questions. We may have time this evening, but for sure tomorrow morning. So with that, I'm going to turn over the mic to James. Uh, it is a joy that this is finally here and that we get to share in this time with Reverend Brown. Uh, as we do so, a couple quick notes about how this is going to flow. We will uh, share in, in Reverend Brown's lecture and, and listen attentively. Uh, when his lecture comes to a close, we'll have a few minutes where if you've had questions and you've written them down on the cards or if you are online um, and are able to join us in that way and you've written them in the comments, uh, we'll collect those and then have an opportunity for Reverend Brown to answer as many as, as, as time allows tonight for us to sit with and, and to reflect on um, after a short little break while we collect those. So uh, as, as Reverend Brown speaks and, and shares with us uh, his, his, his lecture, uh, you're encouraged to write down any questions that pop up um, that, that enter into your mind. And uh, for those that are here, there will be a reception afterwards in the fellowship hall um, where Reverend Brown does have some of his books available uh, for purchase. Uh, one is a new kind of venture leader, and then another is uh, a Linton study that was just recently published, just this year, right? Um, so, and it's perfectly timed for Lent. So if you're interested in a Linton study or a book on leadership, uh, Reverend Brown has those available um, and they'll be in the fellowship hall during the reception. So uh, with that said, let's, let's have a word of prayer before we get, get started. Gracious and, and loving God, we thank you for the, the gift that is, uh, that is this time, uh, for a time to listen and reflect, to hear, um, and, and to seek. Uh, as we share in this time, we are grateful for uh, John P. Lewis and, and for this this lecture series that is a testament to his, 
his dedication uh, to the church, to the future of the church, and to making a difference in, in growing as a people of faith. Lord, we pray that you would bless this time and watch over us during it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. to Jim for your hospitality and your family. Uh, James, thank you for your hospitality and your leadership. And I saw Ron uh, earlier. We have really had a great opportunity to be here uh, in Rogers, Arkansas. And I grew up in uh, Texas. And so this part of the country is not unfamiliar to me. And I've always enjoyed uh, being here in Arkansas and all of the tremendous and wonderful resources you have from natural resources to corporations to one of the greatest being the people and you are very kind and generous people so thank you so much we've already prayed and we already know what we're here for and as we continue to give thanks and appreciation to the Lewis family as we are having this lecture series on this evening and the topic in the title is our Methodist journey now and next we welcome those of you who are here. Hopefully you join us uh, tomorrow. And we also welcome those who are watching uh, online, wherever you may happen to be uh, in the world. Earlier today, during our worship experience, we spoke from Acts chapter 2. Well, tonight I want to go to the end of the book of Acts, to chapter 27, uh, verses 22 through 26. One of my favorite uh, scriptures and stories. And, and this is what it says. Now I urge you to be encouraged, not one of our lives or your lives will be lost, though we will lose the ship. Last night, an angel from the God to whom I belong and whom I worship stood beside me. The angel said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. Indeed, God has already graciously given you everyone sailing with you. Be encouraged, men, and let's be inclusive. Women, if we're speaking today. I have faith in God that it will be exactly as God told me. However, we must run aground on some island. This is a wonderful story of Paul the Apostle, who is a prisoner at this time, and traveling with other prisoners, really in what would be considered a prison transport that happened to be a ship. And he was going before Caesar because he had been arrested of his faith in following Jesus Christ. He had encouraged them not to sail because for some reason he knew that this would not be the best time. And they ran into some issues on the sea. And they are preparing uh, to literally lose the ship. And an angel visits Paul and reassures Paul, you will make it, but the ship won't make it. I think so often as we are approaching this part of the United Methodist journey and story, Many people are wondering, will we remain as one denomination, one church? And so the question is being raised, will the ship of Methodism make it? And so we'll come back to that in just a moment or two. I want to give special thanks to some folks who I lean on so much in, in this journey, not only um, <clears throat> as a pastor in the local church, but as a teacher, coach, and consultant, the three people uh, one is Tom Berlin, who is a lead pastor at Flourish United Methodist Church in Virginia, and uh, you will hear a lot of Tom's work and see a lot of his work in the slides that I'll share with you tonight, but has done a phenomenal job of teaching uh, a lot of what I'll be talking about, where the church is and where the church is going. Uh, Jasmine Smothers, who is a colleague of mine in the North Georgia Annual Conference, <clears throat> is a lead pastor of Atlanta First uh, United Methodist Church in, in Georgia. And then Cedric Bridgeforth, who is a pastor as well, who is with the Cal PAC. We call it uh, California Pacific Annual Conference. And much appreciation to each of them for coaching me up and helping me be before you this evening. So although I stand here, I am not alone. There are so many voices and folks uh, across the country who have been a blessing to me and to our denomination. And these are three of them. That I give special thanks. And you'll actually see a quick video with Tom in it a little bit later. So um, the topic of our discussion tonight is where are we now and what does next look like? And a big part of that is around human sexuality 
and a decision for annual conferences, <clears throat> local churches, and lay and clergy to make a determination of remaining uh, within the denomination or transitioning, disaffiliating, and moving on. But I believe it's important for so many people who don't know all of the history, in particular of the Methodist movement and church, to go back a little bit before we started seeing the language around human sexuality in what is called the Book of Discipline, the governing document for our United Methodist Church. Um, and it's what we call the central jurisdiction. Uh, the central jurisdiction was established in 1939, and it was a form of segregation in the life of what we call the Methodist Church. The April 1968 merger, and that's what gave us what we call ourselves UMC, uh, that created the United Methodist Church, not only birthed a new denomination, it abolished a painful part of Methodist history, which was the central jurisdiction, which segregated African Americans from their Methodist brothers and sisters. What is a little bit of the history of the central jurisdiction? It was an earlier 1939 merger that created the Methodist Church from the Methodist Episcopal Church, the Methodist Episcopal Church South, and the Methodist Protestant Church. The Southern Church only agreed to union after a compromise created a jurisdiction based exclusively on race, not geography. So this next image you will see is a map of the United States of America, a map <clears throat> not created by the US government, a map not created by any state, a map not created by any county or any city or any local municipality, a map that was created by the Church of Jesus Christ. Those darkened areas represent what we call <clears throat> the central jurisdiction. And this is what it says on one of the paragraphs. Six jurisdictional conferences are proposed for the United States. The central, indicated by the barred sections, includes the organized Negro conferences and missions. Outside the United States, the administrative divisions will be called central conferences, which is what they still are today. And so as we <clears throat> are working through uh, human sexuality, so often we start there. But we must remember that from the very beginning of what we call Methodism, we have not been inclusive of all of God's children. Minority brothers and sisters have suffered at the hands of the church. Women have suffered at the hands of the church. Native Americans have suffered at the hands of the church. So as we talk about human sexuality, it's important that you see the broader image of who and what we have been as Christians. And unfortunately, we have not been kind to each other and all of God's children. So we hold that in the backdrop as it relates to our African-American brothers and sisters and a decision that was made through legislation and theologically that we would be separate but yet be in the same church together. So the General Conference of 1972, and I'm sure each of you know this, but just a quick coach up, uh, the General Conference <clears throat> meets every four years and it is the only organized part of what we call the United Methodist Church that speaks on behalf of the United Methodist Church and from General Conferences are produced what we call books of discipline, which is why you see the books of discipline are designated for every four years, representing each of the four years of a general conference. So in 1972, and this is only four years, a lot of people think uh, the word or phrase United Methodist has been around forever. It's 1968, uh, not that long ago. But four years <clears throat> after the merger forming the United Methodist Church, uh, the 1972 General Conference added a sentence to a proposal from a study group on human sexuality that declared the practice of homosexuality to be incompatible with Christian teaching. So when you see that in the Book of Discipline, you know where it comes from, 1972. We can go on to the next slide. 
the 1984 General Conference reversed its 1980 decision to declare that self-avowed practicing homosexuals are not to be accepted as candidates ordained as ministers or appointed to serve in the United Methodist Church. And then in 1988, at the 1988 <clears throat> General Conference, it created a committee to study homosexuality. One of the things we do very well in the United Methodist Church is create committees to study different things in the world. Now, in 1992, delegates opposed a petition uh, from the Homosexuality Study Committee to assert that the Christians were not of common mind about homosexual practice. And then in 1996 at the General Conference, delegates prohibited clergy from conducting services of same-sex unions. Then we moved to 2000 General Conference. Delegates reaffirmed the statement in the social principles that homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. And then we shift to the 2004 General Conference, once again, every four years, being a self-avowed practicing homosexual became a chargeable offense for which a United Methodist clergy person could be tried in a church court. Now, I want to stop at the next slide, which is the 2008 General Conference, and this is important to know. Delegates continue <clears throat> the church's stance to deny ordination to self-professed practicing homosexuals deny general church funds to programs that promote the acceptance of homosexuality and made it a chargeable offense for pastors to conduct services of union for persons of the same gender. They defeated a proposal that would recognize United Methodists deeply disagree with one another, yet all seek a faithful witness. Now, here is the challenge that this presents and becomes very problematic, in particular for United Methodist clergy, who could be brought up on charges if they perform a same-sex union within the confines of our local churches. And this is what makes it problematic. There are individuals, like those of you here at First United Methodist, in particular with the transition from Central, that helped to purchase this property so that this church owns it outright. There are churches across this country who have done the same, to build new properties, they've invested in existing properties. And imagine <clears throat> you're a same-sex couple in this church, and you are faithful to the church, and you are generous to the church, and you literally help build the church, and you decide to get married. And you were told that you cannot be married in the church that you literally help build and pay for because you are a same-sex couple. Now, I've done a lot of heterosexual marriages in my pastorate, and a lot of those folks probably should have never gotten married. <laughs> but because they're heterosexual, and some just came and got married in the church because it was nice, it was beautiful, don't have any affiliation with it, but because they are a same-sex couple, they have full right and authority to be married in a place that they don't even care anything about. And to me, that's not about theology. It's really about justice. Or what happens to a United Methodist clergy person who has a rather large family, say four or five children, and part of the tradition <clears throat> in their family is that the clergy person, man or woman, marries all of the children. And one of the children is gay. And that child decides to get married. And that parent has married all of their children. But because of the law and the legislation of the church that they serve in, they don't have a right to marry their own child. And it becomes extremely problematic. Now, the next slide, also in the 2008 General Conference, delegates also stated <clears throat> that all persons are individuals of sacred worth, created in the image of God, and that United Methodists are to be welcoming, forgiving, and loving one another as Christ has loved and accepted us. 
So in other words, we don't necessarily agree with you, but we love you. Is this justice or theology? In the 2012 General Conference, the assembly retained the current stance saying the denomination considers all persons are individuals of sacred world, worth. However, the church does not condone the practice of homosexuality and considers this practice incompatible with Christian teaching. And then we move closer to where we are now, the 2016 General Conference. Late afternoon, <clears throat> May 18th, delegates voted to accept the recommendation of the Council of Bishops to delay a debate on homosexuality at this gathering of the denomination's top legislative assembly and let a proposed commission study church regulations and offer a way forward. And this is what it's called some years ago and still today, the commission on a way forward. Now, why was this significant? Because this commission was made up of a diverse group of people. It was a total of, of 32 people from all jurisdictions. It was men <clears throat> and women from nine different nations, 15 different states, straight and gay, laity, elders, deacons, bishops, full span of generations, and all across the ideological spectrum. And so these individuals came together to see if there could be a way forward with all of the diversity of thought and theology within our denomination. This was the vision of that team. The commission will design a way for being, uh, the, the commission will design a way for being church that maximizes the presence of United Methodist witness in as many places in the world as possible, that allows for as much contextual differentiation as possible, and that balances an approach to different theological understandings of human sexuality with a desire for as much unity as possible. And so there was a special call, General Conference 2019, which I and others across the world were blessed and privileged to attend in person, and also some individuals watched, or many individuals watched online. In that 2019 General Conference, uh, out of all the things that were considered, two of the things were these two plans. One uh, is the one church plan, and the second is the traditional plan. And the one church plan was produced through the work of the commission on the way forward. What were some of the highlights of the one church plan? Recognizes the diverse theological and scriptural understandings of our global church and provides generous unity for conferences, churches, and pastors. It also removes the restrictive language that I talked to you about earlier from our current book of discipline and maintains the st current structure of the denomination. So those were some of the highlights of the one church plan. What were some of the highlights of the traditional plan? It heightens the current restrictions <clears throat> in the book of discipline concerning LGBTQ and I would add IA plus marriage and ordination. It replaces the just resolution process with suspension and removal of credentials. And then finally, it streamlines the process to enforce penalties for violations of the book of discipline related to marriage and ordination of self-avowed practicing homosexual persons. So meaning not only could individuals not marry uh, same-sex couples or they get married in our churches, but also self-avowed uh, uh, individuals who are in same-sex unions could not be ordained in the life of our church. And so at the end or during this call 2019 general conference, these two plans were presented and the vote came in favor of the traditional plan which is where we live today. Now, I like uh, this work from Tom Berlin, and these are famous sugar packet images um, that people have seen. And so it looks and appears uh, as these sugar packets, and I won't show you all the slides where they actually open and everything, but this is just a way to illustrate not where everyone is, but where a good majority of people are in the United Methodist Church. Uh, on the left, uh, progressive non-compatibilists, 
um, to the right, progressive compatibilists. Um, to the right of progressive compatibilists are traditionalist compatibilists. And then to the far right are traditionalist non-compatibilists. So if you're looking at both ends of the spectrum, on one end would be the progressive non-compatibilists, and then on the other end would be the traditionalist non-compatibilists. Now, this is how they would view same-sex relationships in light of being in the church, just in this uh, part of the conversation. So, traditionalist non-compatibilists would say, <clears throat> marriage is between a man and a woman, and I cannot be in a church where others disagree with me or are allowed to do something different than what I believe regarding same-sex marriage. So they're saying, if we can't uh, all agree that it is not the right thing to do, I can no longer be uh, in this denomination, all right? And then the traditional compatibilists would say, marriage is between a man and a woman, and I can be in a church where others disagree with me and are allowed to do something different than what I believe regarding same-sex marriage. So they're saying, look, I don't agree with it, but I am here with everybody, and, I'm all, and I am okay being in a space where we don't all agree. Now, let's look on the opposite end of the spectrum. A progressive compatibilist would say, God's gay and lesbian children should be able to marry in the church, and I can be in a church where others disagree with me. You see where they are. We believe, as they're saying, that you should be able to marry within the church of Jesus Christ, i.e. Methodists, and although everyone doesn't agree with that, I can still stay in this denomination knowing it. The progressive non-compatibilists would say God's gay and lesbian children should be able to marry in the church, and I cannot be in a church where others disagree with me. So you see how the non-compatibilists are on both ends of the spectrum. Now, you'll see on this next slide, from what I've heard and the conversations that I listened to, it seems, and we can go to the slide with the sugar packets again, it seems like um, the great majority of people who call themselves United Methodists are right there in the middle uh, between progressive compatibilists and traditional compatibilists, which seems to be the majority of where most uh, United Methodists are. All right, so the decision at the call session of the 2019 uh, General Conference was made, and that was in favor of the traditional plan. Where did that leave us? It left us preparing for General Conference 2020, but what happened in 2020? A pandemic that is still going on. And so individuals started working behind the scenes to present and propose legislation for the 2020 General Conference, which did not happen. And so this legislation is still there in the atmosphere, ready to be considered when we have General Conference. Here are four of the primary plans. Uh, the new denomination of United Methodism called the Indianapolis Plan, the new expressions worldwide from UM Ford, the next generation UMC from UMC Next, and then what we call uh, the protocol of reconciliation and grace through separation. And it is believed that the protocol embraces the great majority of the other three plans that you see on the screen. And so therefore, for the rest of our conversation, we'll focus on the protocol. But before we focus on the protocol, let me share the names of several groups that have been working for the visioning of the United Methodist Church's future. Some of these are uh, conservative and some are liberal. Uh, the Global Methodist Church, UMC Next, Love Your Neighbor, and UM Forward. And so these are coalitions and groups that over the years have worked behind the scenes for the visioning of the future of the church. Everyone doesn't agree with each other, and the work that they do is valued by those who identify with where they're going and where they see the church going. And so I, I showed this just to share that there is a great diversity of thought and great diversity of opinion on where we will need to go. But it is the general conference that makes that final decision 
and then processes the legislation of the decision that is being made. Now, I mentioned the protocol earlier. What is the genesis of the protocol? Bishop Yambasu called together a group of individuals, and I won't say much about it. You'll hear Tom talk about it. And they came together and formed the group representing the protocol. You'll see on this picture, out of these individuals that are shown, there are two who are no longer living. Uh, Bishop Yambasu, who is the convener of that group, is no longer living. And Junius Dotson, who was a former general secretary of Board of Discipleship Ministries, passed away a year ago uh, this month. And so out of that group, there are two who are no longer living. What is this group all about? And so when we think about this group coming together, Bishop Yambasu and Central Conference bishops called the group together in July 2019 in Chicago as a response to what happened at the Special Call General Conference in 2019. It's made up of U.S. bishops, members of central conferences, and remember, central conferences are beyond the United States of America, made up of progressives, traditionalists, centrists, representing a variety of groups in the United Methodist Church. They had no budget, all volunteer, and no authority. All right, so let's uh, watch this clip from Tom Berlin. He does a fantastic job because he is a part of the protocol. And I'll be right back. Now, back in August of 2019, Bishop John Yambasu, who's a bishop in Sierra Leone, Africa, he began to really feel the calling of the Holy Spirit to call a meeting. He actually felt that right after General Conference, which was in February. By the time August rolls around, he's invited some other Central Conference bishops. Those are bishops in places like the Philippines and Africa and Europe. And he said with them, you know, maybe we could convene a meeting with Americans because largely this is where the tension is, is the United States. And so he said, maybe if I brought together leaders who are traditional leaders in the, what's called the Reform and Renewal Coalition, maybe if I brought centrist leaders together in renewal groups in that center space, maybe if I brought progressive leaders, maybe if I brought them together, perhaps we could think of something they would actually bring us a sense of resolution instead of conflict. Because in truth, the 2019 General Conference was a very conflicted space. No one left that experience feeling good about it, I think, is, is fair to say. So Bishop Yamasu brought that group together in August. It was a difficult meeting because those people all disagree on these matters. But the meeting had enough promise that a subset of that larger group met together again in September, now adding some U.S. bishops into their number. And that group decided to continue talking. They decided that they needed a mediator, someone who would be an outside person who could help the group process the, the situation that they were trying to resolve. And so we talked to different people. I was one of the people in that group. And <clears throat> suddenly a person arose that none of us really expected. His name was Ken Feinberg, Kenneth Feinberg. Mr. Feinberg is a well-known mediator in America and even around the globe. He settled some major difficult cases. The BP um, Deepwater Horizon spill, TARP, the, the too, big, um, too big to fail um, situation on Wall Street, um, the 9-11 fund, the Hokie Spirit fund, um, Volkswagen, on and on. I could give you, frankly, any of the major mediation cases in the United States in the past couple of decades. Ken Feinberg has been the heart of the resolution. You know, he's not a United Methodist. He's not a United Methodist. In fact, he's Jewish. But when he met with us, he said, um, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it for free. And some of us wanted to know why. What he said is, you know, I've checked into you all. You're about roughly 12 million people around the globe and you do really good work. You do things that matter. He knew about um, Imagine No Malaria and, and what we had done there. He knew about our, our um, hospitals and our, our schools and the work we do here in the United States, but also those things abroad. And Mr. Feinberg said, because you matter, I'm going to do this and I'm not going to charge you. And if I travel, I won't charge you for that. Not one penny was going to be. Here's the commitment to the protocol. And these are just some high points. Groups will no longer support the plans they created. Separation is assumed. Mediation team will develop legislation to offer 
the 2020 General Conference, which did not happen. Group will use best efforts to encourage all parties groups to vote for protocol legislation. Those who choose to separate agree to bring no claims for additional assets of the United Methodist Church in the future. So those are some of the high points. Now, each of these plans and proposals are available online. You can read through those. But what's next? And that is general conference. So on this next slide, it's important to know that there is a group called the Commission on General Conference, which gives oversight uh, to the hosting uh, of general conferences around the world because they can literally meet around the world. And this is an image of some of those uh, team members uh, on the Commission on General Conference. Here is what is before them currently. Will General Conference meet in 2022, which is slated to happen this summer? And I understand that we'll know in just a little while what their decision will be. We don't know if we will have General Conference in 2022, 2023, or do we wait and go 2024. Part of the issue, as we even see here in the United States of America, that there are some parts of our country where technology uh, is not that widely accessible. We also know there are visa issues for individuals overseas, and there's this thing called a COVID-19 pandemic, where if we think about in the United States of America how we debate over should you get vaccines or not, and there are probably literally healthcare centers who have thrown away vaccines, there are parts of the world that uh, what we've thrown away would literally uh, give everything to have. And so when you put all of these things together, will we be able to have this global meeting where we have to have the representation via the delegates? So what does that mean? It means that these proposals and that these forms of legislation that have been presented uh, hang in limbo until the general conference representing uh, the will of the church can meet and delegates can make those decisions. So I told you we would go back to the scripture in Acts 27, 22 through 26, and you'll see it here on this next slide. You know, Paul um, told his fellow prisoners, look, um, the ship's not going to make it, but you're going to make it. And <clears throat> this is the famous text that I love where it says the ship runs aground and starts to break up. And it says those who could swim, they swam. But others took pieces of the ship and they made it to safety on broken pieces. And so we don't know if this ship called United Methodist will make it. It's still a fairly new denomination. It had issues when it was formed in 1968, and in 2022, it still has issues. And the reason I started with the central jurisdiction is because in any circumstance, when we don't know our history, we are fail to repeat it. And the truth of the matter, as Christians, we have not been kind to all of God's children, and it did not begin with human sexuality. It's happened over gender, it's happened over economics, it's happened over geography, it's happened over land, it's happened over race. Historically, we have not been kind to all of God's children. So what's next? Here are the four things that I want to close our conversation with, and I want to give a brief highlight from what we're doing in our local church. Number one, continue in community. That's what we talked about this morning from Acts chapter 2. As the church of Jesus Christ, we are the community. <clears throat> Number two, continue in conversation like these Lewis lectures. Not only having them here in Rogers, but having them all over the world. In moments when we agree and in moments when we don't agree, when conversation breaks down, it becomes very difficult to move forward. Number three, continue in prayer. And number four, continue in ministry how? Make disciples <clears throat> of Jesus Christ. So the church I get a pleasure to serve as one of the pastors of is Impact United Methodist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. And Impact Church's work in these following areas is our commitment to move forward as the ship is still together. Move forward in vision, 
move forward in community, making disciples, <clears throat> and what we call phase 2A. What is our vision? Our vision is to be an inclusive gathering of people committed to holistic salvation and doing Christ's work in the world. We've decided as a local church, it doesn't matter what the global church decides, we will be an inclusive gathering of people sharing the love of Christ with the world. And you know, when I see the work that you do here at First Methodist, it sounds like you've decided to do the same. Do you all agree? No. Do you all see the scripture the same theologically? No. But it sounds like as a faith community, you've decided to love all of God's children. And I believe that is the representation of what it means to be a believer. The second is our commitment to community. We have a wonderful uh, United Way <clears throat> in our area, and they've done a lot of research, and they put together what is called a child well-being study. And so this is a grid of Metro Atlanta, and this grid would mimic any major metropolitan area throughout the United States of America. I'm sure it would be the same in Houston. It would be the same in Dallas. It would be the same in San Francisco. It would be the same in Los Angeles. It would be the same here. The further you get out into the suburbs, the healthier it is for children and youth. The closer you get in, uh, the more unhealthy it is. I know some of you are, are big sports fans, and you could give me this fact, but I don't know any other city in the United States of America that within a few years apart built a brand new football stadium and a brand new baseball stadium. Of course, the Braves just won the what? There you go. <clears throat> And so when you watch the Atlanta Falcons play football in a billion-dollar stadium that Arthur Blank built, who was one of the founders of Home Depot, if you go outside of that billion-dollar stadium, the life expectancy of a kid is a red zone and will likely live fewer years than a kid who's born just 10 or 20 miles down the road in a greener neighborhood. Is that theology? Or is that justice? You know, I've told our church leaders, whenever you get this kind of statistics, you don't need to pray anymore about what God wants you to do. You know what God wants you to do. And so for us in our church, regardless of what the general conference decides or our annual conference decides, we know how to be the church of Jesus Christ. The data is telling you every single day where the needs are. And I see over in this park that you own <clears throat> and land next door of the book resources that people can receive and the food resources and the clothing resources and how the second you put resources in there, it becomes empty again. It says that you are concerned beyond these walls. And so for us, just like you, it's about vision. For us, just like you, it's about community. But then there's another piece to that, and that is making disciples. Um, on the next couple of slides, you'll see one of the pictures of uh, our laypersons. You can go one more slide. Um, <clears throat> who is um, in seminary and is also an intern. And so we're super proud of Julia, who's doing great work. But um, one of the things we decided when we started church 15 years ago we would treat it a little bit like a for-profit. And so if you're a CEO of a for-profit, you've got to give your quarterly update to the shareholders. So what is historic in our church is we give a quarterly update. Now, when the quarter is good, it's always great to stand up and talk about what's happened. But there are some quarters where it's not so good. But we've actually won people to the church because they said, you know, I've never been in a church that's been this transparent. So we just gave the fourth quarter uh, update uh, last month of how we closed out 2021, but, but in the last quarter of the year, there were 15 people who were baptized. Um, there were three people, some churches called them members, we call them impactors, who became impactors. And there were 544 folks who received Holy Communion. And so it's all about making disciples. And that work doesn't take a bishop, that work doesn't take a DS, that work doesn't take a book of discipline, that work doesn't take a general conference. We are called, what does Matthew 28 say? To go where? Into all the world, making disciples of who? Jesus Christ. And so for us, it's about vision. 
It's about community, and it's also about making disciples. And then there's another big part, and we call it our Phase 2A. Now, we started in a uh, middle school, and it was a uh, public school, and a few years later, we were able to acquire property. And the same way we've gained some people to our church, we also lost some people. Because you imagine, <clears throat> there's this promise that some people have, in particular, if they came from a uh, certain faith tradition. All right, we're going to hang with y'all for a little bit in this public school, but I know one day we're going to have this fancy church building, and we're going to have crosses and all the things that I grew up with, and, and, and I'm just going to feel at home again. Well, this was the property that we bought, and some people left because this was not a church. It was a dilapidated warehouse in the middle of a community not far from the airport in Atlanta, and that's the way it looked on the outside with the brick, and then uh, it looked like this on the inside. But now, after 2014 moving in, it has become one of the epicenters of that community. We purchased it at 76,000 square feet, and it sits on 10 acres of land. And so, since 2014, we've been able to develop what we call phase one. But remember that United Way study um, and seeing that kind of data on our community, which is a red zone, our zip code, we decided to move into what's called phase 2A. And so this next picture you'll see is the uh, gym architectural rendering uh, of, uh, of what we're uh, gonna develop in that remaining 50,000 square feet. Now that green bottom area, you can tell there are some rows there. That's the future, future worship area, but we're not gonna do that right now. And that was even before the pandemic. We decided that is not our priority. Um, to the right, that uh, pink area is the only new build. Everything else would be under roof. That's a gymnasium um, with two NBA-sized basketball courts where kids can come from all over the community 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and play basketball. And if a police officer picks up a 14-year-old kid at 2 a.m. in the morning, we want that police officer to have two choices. I can take this kid to the station and begin a record that will follow this kid for the rest of their life, or there's a local church down the street that's open right now who would love this kid, and that kid would have a different trajectory. And so that's a part of phase 2A, this beautiful gymnasium. And then <clears throat> the next part of that phase 2A, remember what's happening to children in our community, are thematic rooms and spaces for children. Just like you, here in Rogers, we're blessed with individuals who represent just every profession on the face of the earth. And here's what we believe in our church. By the time a kid graduates from high school, they can know two things, what they want to be and what they don't want to be. And they don't have to spend their 20s kind of figuring this thing out. Because when I was in seventh grade, there was an engineer in my home church who let me go to work with her. And I discovered I wanted to be an engineer, but after a couple of days going, I don't want to be an engineer. Or I discovered I really do want to be an engineer. Dream with me. What would happen if after school all of these buses came into our parking lot from schools across our community? Half the kids would go into the gymnasium and get the physical health vitality that they need. The other half would go into these thematic rooms where these rooms are designed after the professions and the environment that's around them. And there are professionals who are there meeting with them and talking to them. And then they would switch out, and the other set would go to the gym, the other set would go to the thematic rooms, we would do our homework together, we would learn languages together, we would do all the STEM upgrade, upscale, all that kind of work together. And then guess what? After it was all said and done, there would be this beautiful family-style meal where we would gather together and eat. And by the time that kid got home, and their parent had just got home because they're working two jobs trying to put food on the table, the kid has already had physical activity, they've already done their homework, they've already been mentored, and guess what? They've had one of the best meals of their life, and they're ready to go to bed. That's how you change a red zone to a green zone in a community when the church of Jesus Christ does more than Sunday morning. We become the hands and feet of Jesus throughout the world. Amen to that. <laughs> You can show that next slide. So phase 2A for us is about these three things. It's about workforce readiness. How do we prepare people for the world? It's about education success. How do we prepare them 
academically, and then it's also about healthy living. And so we are also in what's called a food desert. And because we're next to the busiest airport in the world, some of the greatest companies in the world have decided that their distribution areas can be in our communities, but their stores can't be in our communities. And for us, that's not okay. You can't make billions of dollars over our head and not have your retail representation in our communities. And so there's a grocery store chain that has a distribution center not too far from our church, literally in walking distance to our church, that prides itself on serving healthy and organic food. But kids in our community can't walk to their closest retail store because they're not in our community. Their distribution center is in our community, but their retail representation is not. And guess what? That's also the work of Jesus Christ, to tell individuals throughout society that that's not okay. We can't just work for you for hourly wages and not be able for, to work or rather to shop in your stores and offer our kids the health and the vitality that you give to the world, but for some reason don't give to the communities where you're warehoused. And so that's what it means to be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. Well, this next slide is what's happening in my life, and about a year ago, I announced to our church that I'd be retiring from pastoral ministry, and so everything that I said to you won't happen under my watch. That will happen under the next leadership team's watch, and whether it happens exactly as I showed you or not, that's not up to me, but I do believe that the work continues as it has continued here from the history of Central from now First Methodist, to your previous two pastors, to now James, and will continue through the work of your clergy, like James and Ron, and also through the work of your lay people. Because when we understand our purpose, as I said to you earlier, there's nothing in heaven, there's nothing in hell, and there's nothing on earth that can stop the movement of God Almighty when the church decides to be the church. So my last Sunday will be the last Sunday in June of 2022, and I will be coaching, consulting, writing, teaching, and preaching full-time, and really helping leaders in churches optimize their systems, their structure, their operations, and be the best individuals and best organizations that they can be. But I am so grateful and fortunate for my journey I had the wonderful privilege of being born in, in Lufkin, Texas, a town of about 40,000 folks. Uh, my mom and dad, I was the youngest of their three, and when I was coming along, they were going through a divorce, and my father was a clergy person, and so my father uh, moved and took a church in Newark, New Jersey. He was a Presbyterian pastor. So imagine nine months out of the year growing up in small town America, and three months out of the year growing up uh, 20 minutes going under the Lincoln Tunnel and being in New York City, and that was just a whole different worldview from a lot of my peers. And then towards the end of his life, he uh, took a church in Los Angeles, California, and so as teenagers, we started going to Los Angeles, California. And I had a wonderful opportunity of being exposed to the Baptist church in my community, uh, to the Presbyterian church with my father, and uh, when I was a teenager in Lufkin, Texas, one of our relatives came home and said, there's a new preacher in town who can sing. And it was a new church start for a United Methodist Church. And we started going to that church, very casual, much like y'all dressed here. And I remember every fifth Sunday was Youth Sunday. And I asked the preacher, hey, can I do the pastoral prayer? And he said, okay. I went home and I wrote that prayer out word for word. And that Sunday I got up there and I was shaking in my boots. And I said the prayer. And Church ended, we went home as usual, but there was a knock on the door, and it was a preacher of that church. And in our living room, no book of discipline, no SBRC, no board of ordained ministry, no DS, didn't know about those things. He gave me the offer of a lifetime as a 13-year-old kid. He said and asked, how would you feel about helping me out on Sunday morning? And as a 13-year-old kid, I started helping him out. He later told me, Olu, there were some folk in the church who didn't think that was a good idea. And I'm so glad this day he didn't listen to what those folks thought. 
And so now, when I retire here in a little bit, and I'll be uh, 44, so it's been about a 31-year journey from starting to serve in the local church at, at 13. And I always told people, I started early <laughs> so I could finish early. <laughs> but you know, I am here today because of churches like First Methodist Rogers, who believed in people in spite of what was happening in the world. And I'm telling you, when we do that for each other, you have no idea whose life you are shaping and forming and what they will go on to do. And that's what it's about. So that's what I'll be doing in my next, that is what our church will be doing. And and something tells me uh, that First Methodist Rogers is gonna be doing some great things as well. I wanna show you these last couple of pictures and, and then I'll be through. James, we probably ran out of the time for Q&A, but here's what's happening in our world right now, from systemic racism to a virus that has taken millions and millions of lives across the world, to rumors and the reality of war. What are we really focused on as a church? What's really important as the church? We've had two years of a pandemic. And some of you have lost people and things that you never thought you could lose. What's really important? I believe the answer to that is each other. Will we all agree? No. Will we all see the Bible the same way? No. But I think what is most important is that we find a way to remain together as the church of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite theologians, Jürgen Moltmann, in his book, theology of hope, he writes this about hope. This hope makes the Christian church a constant disturbance in human society, seeking as the latter does to stabilize itself into a continuing city. It makes the church the source of continual new impulses towards the realization of of righteousness, freedom, and humanity here in the light of the promised future that is to come. The church, he says, is to be a constant disturbance in a broken world to remind all of the world and everyone that there is a Savior who was born, a Savior who lived, a Savior who died, and a Savior who rose again. And his name is Jesus Christ. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you, Olu, and you are right. You did run all the way to time, so we'll have to hold your questions for uh, tomorrow morning. Um, as, you, as you make your way out, there is a red box if you are headed to, uh, whether you're headed out the narthex and going back to your car, or you are uh, headed to the fellowship hall for the uh, reception that is to follow this, there's a red box on that window seal, and there's a red box on the, on the usher stand in the narthex. And if you want to stick your questions on your card in there, uh, that would be a great place for them to go for us to be able to, to have them on hand for tomorrow. Um. <laughs> there are more than enough cookies, uh, and we were told at lunch today that calories on, on Sunday don't count if you've been to church, so um, they don't count. So uh, we hope you'll join us for that and share in that time. Thank you again, Olu. Uh, if you just want to stop by and get his books, they are in there as well and, and available. So. Uh, Thank you all for sharing in this time with us tonight.